So th this morning's message is going to be driving back the vultures and defending the covenant. We're in Genesis chapter 15, and I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Well, Lord God, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are the true and the living God. And that when we talk to you, when we ask or speak, you hear. Amen. And not only are you a God that hears, but you're a God who speaks. That's right. In fact, uh, from the beginning of creation, you started speaking. You created the universe itself by speaking. And you've never stopped speaking. Mm. Even though some people might theologically think that you have. But you continue to speak and you'll continue to speak into eternity. For you are a living God and we can have a living relationship with you. Amen. I want to thank you for the person of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. That was his covenantal act. The blood of the covenant, the, the cross of the covenant. And, and through Christ now we can have access into the very presence of God. And through Christ Jesus we become sons of God yeah. by the new covenant. And so I want to thank you for the power of covenant, Lord. And I want to thank you for Jesus and all that he's done so that we can enter boldly into the presence of God and speak boldly. And we can know that we are adopted as sons of God because of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for your love that still motivates you as you intercede before the throne of God day and night for us. As it says in the book of Hebrews, we want to thank you, living God, that you're a loving God and you want living relationship. And you don't want us just to have a religious experience. You want us to walk and talk with you and you want to walk and talk with us. And I thank you for this reality. So, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our ears this morning. And let the word of God become like a fire in our bones, a fire in our bellies. A fire in our hearts, a fire that we could not contain, that it would just burn within us. Well, we want to burn with passion. We want to burn with zeal. We want to burn with a fiery faith, Lord Jesus. We want, to, we want to have that consuming fire, which is the presence of God, for God is a consuming fire within us. Let your word burn within us and change us and transform us and burn away the dross, Lord. Burn away the garbage. Burn away the rubbish in our lives by your holy presence, I pray in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> so we're looking at the, the book of Genesis, chapter 15. I'll start with actually verse 1. God comes to Abraham. And we, we saw uh, last Sunday, God will enter into no permanent relationship with a human being outside of covenant God could visit and speak to Pharaoh he could visit and speak to I don't know anybody that he wants to but there will not be a long lasting permanent relationship without people entering into covenant you will not have a covenant without a sacrifice and it's two way all covenants are two way. That's right. And uh, you cannot have a sacrifice. And here's the good news for you. There's no sacrifice without death. Mm. And both parties, it says in Hebrews, it says both parties need to die to enter into it. That's right. Mm. And so the Lord comes to Abraham because what the, the Lord is seeking a covenant relationship with Abraham. But the Lord is actually seeking a deeper covenant relationship. Because the Lord has already spoken to Abraham. The Lord has already come to Abraham. This is amazing. Did you know that the Lord will bring you into deeper levels of revelation of covenant? Amen. The Lord is going to bring you to deeper levels of commitment in covenant. Yeah. Because the Lord wants you to have deeper intimacy That's with Him. Right. That's right. yeah. It's a growing knowing. And we want to move from grade one level understanding of covenant to move into university. Amen. Yeah. Who wants to really know God? Amen. Who wants to go deeper? Amen. So God actually now approaches, not the first time, but he's approaching Abraham again. And God has made many promises and Abraham's been believing for the promises and he's been tested in his faith. He's been waiting and not seeing. He's been faithful. And so God now comes again to bring Abraham to a whole deeper 
a whole newer level of covenant understanding that is going to lead to a whole new deeper level of being able to receive the blessings, the rewards, and experiencing the presence of God. Yes. That's exciting. Mm. If you think that you've arrived, I feel sorry for you. Mm. I haven't. There's got to be more than this, and there is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is so powerful. So the Lord comes to Abraham in verse 1. It says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I am your great reward. This is powerful. Because we think about the blessings of God and the rewards of God. And you know what the greatest blessing of God is? God himself. He is the blessing. He is the reward. We go and run after other things, but we miss out on the fact Jehovah Sneaky leads us through a journey. And he's like the carrot before the donkey, you know. We're like a lot of donkeys. And so what he does, he puts carrots before the donkeys and says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to give you such and such. If you follow me, we're running after the donkey. But Jehovah Sneaky has another agenda. Do you know what that is? He wants you to find him. He wants you to have a deeper relationship with him. And so he just uses the carrot so that he can build that deeper relationship. And so he says, I am your shield, which means I am your protection. Mm. The word for shield in the Hebrew, in fact, uh, some versions of the Bible say, I am your sovereign. Mm. Sovereign means king. Because the word for shield and the word for sovereign is the same. You heard about spiritual covering? That you need to be under a spiritual covering? You need to be under God's covering? Well, that's because... His authority is your shield. Yes. And being under authority in the body of Christ is a shield of protection for you. He says, I am your great reward. I am your precious treasure. Now, the Lord goes on. He speaks to Abraham and he's reminding him of the promises. And Abraham is saying to the Lord, well, if that's so, how can it be? Because I don't even have a son. How can I have the promise of God that's going to be fulfilled through my sons and and future generations? There's no one to receive the blessing from me. There's no one to receive the inheritance. I have no son. How could this be? And so the Lord now reestablishes and gives him a deeper revelation of covenant to affirm the promise. Because Abraham's asking, how can I know that this is true? Well, God says... I myself, it says in Hebrews, it's impossible for God to lie. Mm. Mm. It's just impossible. It's it's against His nature. If the promises of God are not your reality, it's not God's fault. Look in the mirror and you'll find out the reason why the promises of God are not yet your reality. Mm. Either that or it's not yet time. Yeah, that's right. Mm. But don't blame Him. Look at yourself, Mm. your side of the covenant. And so he's asking, so the, so the Lord says this to him, starting in verse 7. And by the way, we'll start with verse 6 because it's a very, uh, one of the most uh, quoted <coughs> scriptures in the New Testament. It says, Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to Abraham as his righteousness. The reason that Abraham was considered by God a righteous, holy man it is because he had faith and he believed in God's promise. Amen. Doesn't mean he was perfect. He was not perfect. It's good news for us. But he believed right. in God's right. promise. Amen. And so now that was credited to it. God, God says, I see you as a holy righteous one because you continue to have faith in me. And even though you fail, you get up again and you don't give up. Amen. That's really good. You can fail and be righteous. Amen. Just get up again. Amen. Okay. And so he said to him, that is the Lord said to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. See, all of this land that lies before you, Abraham, I have promised to give you this land as your inheritance. I do not lie. It's impossible for me to lie. I have promised this to you. You you and your descendants will inherit it and you will be blessed and the nations will be blessed through you as I have promised. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I really gain possession of it? If you would study the New Testament 
And you would carefully study all the promises of God for you in the New Testament. You would be blown away. Most of us have only just begun to receive the beginnings of the promises. There is so much more. And so we can be like Abraham going, we've received all these amazing promises from God. You know, healing and deliverance and, and he's going to prosper us. And it's just not talking about money alone. It's talking about prosper us spiritually, prosper us in our relationships. That's Remember, right. ultimately, he is the treasure. That's right. Yes. And actually, good and godly relationships are the great and precious treasure more than money can buy. That's right. Yes. Okay, we need a mind shift in regards to prosperity yeah. thinking, yeah. I believe. Yeah. It's more than money. There's some really That's rich right. people that are really empty, sad, and lonely. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you study the New Testament. You, you research even the book of Revelation. There's 22 promised rewards in the book of Revelation. Most people can only ever see the Antichrist. There's more than seven promised blessings in the book of Revelation. Most people are still seeing 666. <laughs> the devil wants you to just focus on him. That's right. Now he is there. That's true. He gets one chapter, the Antichrist. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the revelation of Jesus. The revelation of... So I want you to think about this. If you consider every promise that God's promised, then you look at your life and you go, what's happening? Mm. What, Abraham? I don't even have a son. I've been walking with the Lord for years. What's going on? And God says, I promise and I don't lie. That's right. But you see, before the promise becomes your reality, you get tested. <coughs> it's, it's actually part of the covenant. Mm -hmm. This is part of the covenant is the rewards and the promises come after you pass the tests. Yes. Uh, the word for covenant in the Greek, diakiti, means terms and conditions. Mm. In other words, it's not just a blank check that God gives everybody. Mm. It's not that I'm a Christian now, so hallelujah, it's all automatically coming. There's terms and conditions. Yes. Right. And one of the terms and conditions, I shared this on Wednesday when we had the meeting. Um, if you want to enter into the revelation of covenant, the mysteries of God to be revealed to you, because you have to understand the mystery before you understand what God wants to give you, because it's a mystery. If you want to enter into that, then you need to pass the tests. And as the more you pass the test, the more you get understanding and the more those things become your reality, uh, which is actually going to be part of our message today. So, you know, how can I know this? And the Lord says, you will possess this land. I promise you. Mm -hmm. So the Lord said to him, bring to me a, a heifer, a goat, and a ram. You know, a heifer is a, a cow. Um, he's three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all of these to him. He cut them in two and he arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half because they were too little. So he just put a pigeon and a dove like that. Okay, so we've got a picture like this. Here is the cow. <laughs> you can see I took art at school. And, you know, there's a lamb. And... There's the goat. They've really been messed up here. Okay, and here's the two birdies. Okay, something looks like this. And I'll just uh, give you an understanding of what this represents for us as New Testament Christians. We talked about the mystery of God on Wednesday, last Wednesday, and how do we qualify to understand the mysteries of God? The fear of the Lord is a key. Yes. Because it says in the book of Psalm 24. It says, uh, the secret or the mystery of God is confided with those that fear Him. Yes. He will reveal to Him His covenant. In other words, the mystery of God is revealed to the people that had the fear of the Lord. And the mystery of God is covenant. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians, the cross is the mystery of God. The cross is the wisdom of God. It's covenant. Okay. So... Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and there would have been vultures and crows and those sort of things. It wouldn't have been eagles. Eagles only eat that which is alive. They don't eat that which is yeah, dead. Right. Vultures eat that which is dead. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's a whole other 
message with that. That's why um, the prophetic ministry is an eagle, not a vulture. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Because we, we feed on that which is alive, not that which is dead. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> but anyway, there's a whole other thing going on. So, now we see that the birds of prey come down on the carcasses, but Abraham drives them away. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved, and they will be mistreated for 400 years. What an awesome promise! Your descendants are going to be slaves, and they're going to be tormented in a foreign land for 400 years. Do you love covenant? Got to read the New Testament again about, you know, yeah. the covenant. Okay, we'll, we'll get to some of these points. <clears throat> you, however, will go to your fathers in peace. And you will be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set, so this was an all day sort of an affair. And when the sun had set and darkness had fallen... A smoking fire pot with blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and he said, Your descendants, to your descendants, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, and it goes on. I want to, I want to point out one thing. <clears throat> The sun sets and it becomes dark with natural night when we're in verse 17. So what happens in verse 12? Because it says Abraham falls into a deep sleep and he's covered. There's a thick and dreadful deep darkness comes upon him. It was spiritual. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. A spiritual darkness which was deep and terrifying and dreadful, comes upon him. Are you really falling in love with covenant this morning? <laughs> it does get better. Yeah, everything gets worse before it gets better in God. You know? That's why you have, to, you have to have the death before you have resurrection. And this is a key. You'll find it all the way. It's a mystery of God. But the thing is, you can't experience the resurrection power of God in your life until you experience the death of Christ. Yeah. Mm. Until you die with Him. Yeah. Death is a gateway. In Christ, <coughs> death is a gateway to life. Yes. And this is what's happening in this story here. <clears throat> now we're going to come back and look at this story a bit more, but I want us to, to look at Psalm 50, verse 4 and 5. Psalm 50, verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> Lord God, I ask that by your Spirit you give us wisdom of these things and understanding. Spirit of wisdom and revelation come upon us. Because, Lord, we've heard many of these things before and understood them in our head, yet it's not impacted our heart and changed our lives. We need deep revelation. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 4 and 5. He summons the heavens above. This is God. The Lord God. He summons the heavens above. He summons the earth that he may judge his people. Notice the judgment of God here is not on the unbelievers. It's not on the nations. It's on His people. And God is calling all of heaven, which is the angels and, and even the demonic powers, all the heavenly beings, He's calling, He's summoning them to what He's about to do. I want you to take witness of this that's coming. He summons the earth, the nations, look at what I'm about to bring to my people. That's for you and for me. And if you look at this, this, the scriptures before this, it's, it's saying things like this, verse 3. Um, and God is coming. He will not be silent. A fire devours before Him. All around Him a tempest is raging. Uh, it's, it's, by the way, the picture of what we see with Abraham, the deep darkness, the tempest that's going on, that sort of thing. Well, it's, it's God. 
God has come into His people deep darkness, thunderings and lightnings mm. Mm. and all of these things. And there's a rage, a holy anger, a wrath that's within Him. And He's going to visit His people. And so here you see God hovering over His people and He's about to unleash judgment. But before He does, He stops and something happens. It says here, the Lord spoke, He says, Gather to me. My consecrated ones, mm. the ones who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Yes. And in history, biblical history and, and human history, I've studied revival uh, throughout our church history. I've studied revival in the Bible. And you know, a lot of revivals, they break out in the shadow of a coming crisis. Or they'll break out in the midst of God's judgment. It's like all of these things are break. All hell seems to be breaking loose, but God's behind it, you know. Mm -hmm. In the midst of this thing, and then suddenly revival breaks out. Mm -hmm. And so here is God. He's about to unleash judgment on His people, but He stops. And He says, before I do anything, gather to me my consecrated ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Nazarites, uh, here the word actually consecrated one is hasadim in the Hebrew. Hasadim. Gather to me my hasadim. Some versions of the Bible says gather to me the saints or my holy ones. Mm -hmm. Hasad is translated into English many ways, but the... the the, the best way to translate it, most accurate way, I've looked at this in Hebrew, the covenant faithful ones. Or the ones who are faithful to the covenant. Mm -hmm. You know the New Testament,